Morning, friends. We're in John chapter 19, and we're going to go through the scenes of Christ's sacrifice on the cross and what preceded it in his trial, which was a mockery, and in his beating. So with that being said, let's go ahead and read together. Then Pilate had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put a purple robe on him. Hail, King of the Jews, they mocked, and they slapped him across the face. When they saw him, the leading priests and temple guards began shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! Away with him, they yelled. Away with him! Crucify him! What? Pilate asked, Crucify your king? We have no other king but Caesar. The leading priest shouted back. Then Pilate turned, to Je- turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus away, carrying the cross by himself. He went to the place called the place of the skull, Golgotha. There he was nailed to the cross where he was crucified. With people on either side, Jesus in between them. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished, and to fulfill scripture, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put a hyssop branch in it, and held it up to his lips. When Jesus had tasted this, he ended up saying, it is finished. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your sacrifice on the cross, the great cost that you paid so that we could experience redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So as I would herald the good news of John 19, would you put into every born-again person's mind a remembrance of how you brought them out of the dominion of darkness and into the kingdom of light. In Christ, would you end up bringing so much of an affection for you that we would end up worshiping you with a greater view of your sacrifice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You're going to see up here John 19. Feel free, anyone back there, to turn on the lights. Let's turn it up in here, huh? Uh, John 19, we're going to talk through uh, a a portion of Scripture that's from about 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. You'll end up seeing Jesus' last hours up here on a timeline. And I am going to take you into three different scenes of his last day. The first one, as we ended up reading about earlier, is going to end up being his flogging. Then we're going to see his mock trial. And the last one we're going to end up seeing is Jesus' crucifixion. And during that time, my goal is for us to enter into first century Jerusalem. There's something about reading a text, and it's black and it's white, and when you read it, you don't really get everything from it. Well, I'm going to be your tour guide this morning. I'm going to take us back into that gruesome day where we see the sights, the feels, and the thoughts possibly of our Lord, Savior, and Savior Jesus Christ. I want us to become reacquainted with Christ's suffering that much more that we would walk out of here with a greater worship of who he is. Are you tracking with me? Okay, so that's the plan for today. During the scene, we're going to go through three of them. In each scene, I'm going to end up giving you some historical context and some teaching. The reason is, again, if you've been born again or not, you've walked through this passage for quite some time, right? And so as we go through some historical context and teaching, my hope is that it would really bring to life that this truly did happen. That Jesus came 2,000 years ago, and he came into a cultural context, and he preserved preserved that cultural context so that we could read generations later, look back at historical documents outside of the Bible and say, oh my goodness, Pilate, the governor of Rome, he was actually real. And we're going to go through some scourging details, so on and so forth. Secondly, you're going to see some slides up here as we walk through the last hours of Jesus' earthly life. And during that time... You're going to end up seeing that they are prophecies fulfilled. I'm not going to talk about them much, but again, my hope in you guys just reading that is for us to have a greater understanding that our sin was so weighty on the God of the universe that he predestined for this to happen. That 700 years prior to this actual day, there were people, Isaiah the prophet, who were prophesying that this actually needed to happen. That's the weightiness of our sin, and that's the reason why prophecies, over 20 of them are going to be fulfilled just on this day. And so with that being said, let's get into scene one. Then Pilate 
had Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip. Here is most likely what the lead-tipped whip actually looked like. So it was nine cords, and on each of them, they had about three different knobs that were filled with glass, bone, dirt. And what they would do for the scourging is they would take that whip, and they would put the victim or the condemned, they would tie up their, their wrists on a post, and then they would end up whipping these Roman soldiers, the backside, starting from up on the shoulders, going down to the lower back, going down to the buttocks, hamstring, down to the heels. It was all encompassing. They would end up whipping on average about 39 times historical documents end up documenting. So each whip, it was so gruesome that each time a person was cut, on average it would be about two inches wide and about one inch deep. So each one needed about 20 stitches. So do the mathematics on that. You end up having three cords, you end up having nine strands, and most likely Jesus is whipped an average of what would have been the average of 39 times. We end up having Jesus' backside, just a gruesome display of over 7,000 stitches that would have been needed for those to be closed. That's how gruesome each one. And, and, and here's the, the crazy thing. It wasn't just that these Roman soldiers were trained just to whip someone on the backside and flog them for punishment. But the, the gruesomeness of it and the skill of it is that they taught the Roman soldiers to flick the wrist back as to rip off as much flesh so that bone and muscle would end up being exposed. This, by the way, most people, most people would not die, but some would. It was all a way to embarrass a person because most likely they were naked. This, this image right here is most likely what Jesus looked like after. And with that, we end up seeing the severity of what truly happened 2,000 years ago when Christ willingly went to the cross. And all of this, by the way, is so unjust that it's happening before an actual Roman trial. Let's continue on. In scene one, we press on into verse two. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and they put a purple robe on him. Hail, king of the Jews, they mocked as they slapped him across the face. The soldiers did not need to weave thorns to put on Jesus' head. They did not need to end up grabbing a purple robe to put over Jesus as he was bloodied and beaten. But they went the extra mile too. It was a representation of humanity's willingness to not only reject God, but these Roman soldiers are embarrassing him. And so that's the scene of what it looks like. And it's just interesting. If you look at the passage, the paradox between what the mocking of these soldiers against Jesus was and what the truth was. They, they see that Jesus is a liar because he's, right, supposedly claiming that he's the king of the Jews. And they're thinking, if you are a king of any nation, you wouldn't allow this. Where, where are your subjects? They, they need to come in and they could stop you. So they are, they are mocking him as after they have beaten him, they've put this crown of thorns on him. And it's just interesting because in Revelation uh, 19 verse 6, we see the reality of this. You know, Jesus' first coming was to actually bring in the kingdom that is unseen, the kingdom of heaven, to restore. He, he came in and, and on the cross, he ended up breaking down the principalities, rulers, and demonic strongholds over all nations, okay? And, and here's the reality. No one else really saw that happening. So they're mocking, and in Jesus' second coming, which is a future time to be, right? We're going to end up seeing him come in, and he's going to whoop some A. Check it out. <laughs> Verse 6. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings, Lord of lords. That's what's about to happen. And he's coming with a sword, and he's going to end up getting vindication. And so all this mockery is just interesting because it's a contrast to reality of future things to come. They didn't understand and neither would have we. But the disrespect ends up continuing. They slapped him across the face. This wasn't the first time that Jesus was slapped across the face. See, right now, he's, in the Rome, he's about to go into the Roman trial. What preceded this, in which we didn't read about, was that there were some Jewish trials. They saw the high priests a couple of times, two, a couple of different high priests. And during that time, we end up seeing that... Jesus was slapped by a guard when he talks back to the high priest. And so this is the second time that they're actually doing it. And it's just, if you really purposely think on what that looks like, it's unfathomable. Okay, so like 
a couple weeks ago, we had the Oscars. You know where I'm going here. And we, yeah, Chris Rock got slapped in the face. Yup. <laughs> you crazy, Terry. And everyone, it was a slap heard across the world, right? Everyone's talking about the disrespect that Chris got. How could Will have done that publicly? And that was an imperfect person slapping an imperfect person. Here in the text, we have an imperfect person slapping a morally perfect person. That would have caused that much more uproar. That's like, now, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there. On, okay. Come yeah, come on. <laughs> Holy Spirit restraint. Thank you. But what's interesting is the face that was told to Moses that if he saw God's face, he would die because he's that holy, is now being slapped by humanity. That when that face became incarnate, he was slapped by a Roman soldier. And yet still Christ is overlooking those sins and he's pursuing the cross. And if we ever wonder about like, okay, what, what is humanity? Is, are we all moral? Are we kind of indifferent about good things in God? Or are we moral beings? Or are we morally corrupted? This is just a representation of humanity's attitude towards a king, King Jesus. Look with me. Isaiah 52, verse 14. It was no surprise to anyone who was Jewish and had a pure heart at the time. This was prophesied 700 years prior. But many were amazed when they saw him, meaning Jesus. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one could scarcely know he was a man. Church. Jesus endured the hardships of the cross and brutal beatings to the point of disfiguration in pursuit of you. In pursuit of City Life Bennington, in, in pursuit of you and yours, your children and your grandchildren, so that we would have an opportunity to put our trust in him. If you've ever struggled with how much you're forgiven, may this end up being a reminder that your forgiveness was bought at a great price. Scene two, we're going to jump into that. We're going to end up seeing the main character, again, is going to end up being Jesus. But this time, we're going to see more of uh, Pilate, and we're going to end up seeing the scrutiny of the religious leaders. So now we end up having Pilate into the mix, and we have a whole bunch of people who are going to criticize Jesus. And by the way, during this time, as we saw up there, Jesus has no sleep. During this whole thing for 14 hours, and even beyond then, because the scriptures don't testify when he actually slept prior to this, he's exhausted. Any of you mamas know what that's like. The dude's not just going through beatings, but he is physically exhausted, entering into scene two. Pilate went outside and said to the people, I'm going to bring him out to you, but understand clearly that I find him not guilty. Not guilty. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said, look, I present to you, here's your man. Here's the king of the Jews couple things. The first one, the governor Pilate is true when he said and rendered the verdict that Jesus was not guilty. You see, behind the scenes in which we haven't covered yet, the reason or the actual beef that the Jews ended up saying were that we're pressing, we're pressing charges on Jesus because he's claiming to be a king. And we knew, I'm speaking as if I'm a Jewish leader, that if we can propose to Roman government that this is sedition, that he's a king who's going to try to overthrow local Roman authority, then he would end up being killed and crucified and embarrassed. And time's gone by, and the governor, Pilate, Roman governor Pilate, says there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with Jesus. He's, he's not who you say he is in terms of trying to overthrow Roman government. And secondly, we end up seeing that Pilate, so convinced that Jesus is not guilty, brings him out and presents him again. Why does he do that? A lot of scholars end up saying he's trying to get the crowd to find mercy on Jesus. As you would envision, uh, the details are just so specific. We can't look past it. These writers are putting every jot and tittle into this narrative so that we would understand. Here is Jesus, crowned of thorns and robed, bloodied and beaten, just an hour after is being presented and no one's having mercy on him. Not one person. We'll end up seeing it here. Verse 6. When they saw him, the leading priests and temple guards began shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! The Messiah who was prophesied in, in their culture 
from generations prior to take the sins of the world, the Messiah, the Savior of the universe, is in front of these Jewish people. And there's nothing but criticism and mocking and saying, murder him, murder him in the most gruesome of ways. So not only, think about this, Jesus is going through physical pain, but he's also experiencing being truly God and truly man and empathizing with all of our weaknesses, right? Prior to this, we end up seeing how human he was when we, we saw that he was agonizing, knowing the cross was coming and he was sweating drops of blood. I couldn't imagine just what he was feeling in this moment. His covenant people, Israel, are saying, screw you, crucify you. Let's read on. Take him yourselves and crucify him, Pilate said. Take him. He's not guilty, the Jewish leaders replied. By our law, he ought to die because he called himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more frightened than ever. Why was Pilate frightened? And this is a historical nerd thing to end up bolstering. Like this dude really existed and Jesus really did step into time and space amongst a culture that was happening and died for our sins. You see, at the time, historical documents end up testifying that the Roman governor, Pilate, he was put on notice just prior to Jesus and his crucifixion. You see, what was happening prior to this was the Roman governor, Pilate, was discreetly killing people. Like, off, you know, if this was prior to the warning that he ends up getting, he would have just rolled with it. He was doing it on a whim. There was no right judgment that he had. He was just killing people off. So historical documents actually have letters written from Caesar himself and that being delivered to him saying, if you end up killing a person and rendering him guilty unto death again without much reason, there's going to be punishment. So there's some fear uh, coming from, from Pilate, like, I can't do this because Caesar's going to end up punishing me. So let's continue on. Let's continue on. That's the posture of Pilate. That's the posture of the religious leaders. And that's the condition of Jesus. Verse 9, he took Jesus back into the headquarters again and asked him, where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Why don't you talk to me? Don't you realize that I have the power to release you or crucify you? Pilate has no clue who he's talking to. No clue at all. The Apostle Paul after this writes in Romans 13 that every local authority, governmental authority is given by God. He has no clue that he's talking to the guy who's given him authority. <laughs> he has no clue who Christ is. But Jesus is going to answer. Look at his retort. Then Jesus said, you would have no power over me unless it were given to you, homie. So the one who's handed me over to you has the greater sin. In other words, he's saying, you think you're in control, but you're not. You think you can control every situation in this life, but you can't. And we end up pressing forward, end up reading on. So not only is he enduring all of these hardships, now he has some jerk who he created telling him, I got power over you. Truly man, truly God, beaten, mocked, and now he has an authority power tripping on him. That's his condition going on to the next verse. Verse 13, Pilate brought Jesus out to them. Then Pilate sat down on the judgment seat on the platform. He's, he's chilling now. And he ends up saying, well, it was now about noon. So now we're making our way to noon on the day of the preparation for the Passover. And Pilate said to the people, look, here's your king. Brings him out again. And look at the response of the crowd once again. Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. What? Pilate asked, crucify your king, murder him, murder him, get rid of him. The rejection that Jesus felt when, they, when he first heard that, and now it's coming back again. I, I would think to myself if I were him, after all I've done for you, who do you think you are telling me that I need to be murdered? And to think that Christ knew that those same people may have an opportunity, they were going to have an opportunity to repent and believe. Crazy to me. So otherworldly, it had to be God. Church, in his weakness, Jesus is power tripped on, he's scrutinized, he's mocked, and he continues to persevere in pursuit of you. 
that each one of you would have an opportunity, and maybe you've already taken advantage of it, to actually come to Christ and put your faith in him for eternal salvation. That's how much he cares for each one of you, for you and yours and your family. Let's press on. We're going to end up seeing scene three where we see the cross. We end up seeing a crucifixion, and we'll see God's character in it. Scene three, last scene, verse 16. So they took Jesus away, carrying the cross by himself. We know historically that the cross was about 125 pounds of raw wood at least, and it could go upwards of 200 plus. And here we have Jesus who's condemned, and historically he would have taken it from where he was rendered guilty, and he would have to walk that bad boy up Calvary's hill. Not knowing exactly how long that was, a raw piece of wood on his exposed back that is cooled overnight and scabbed. That's exactly what's happening. Let's read on. Verse 18. There they nailed him to the cross. The Persians created crucifixions. The Romans perfected it. It was an extension of the scourging and the flogging. It was meant to embarrass the condemned. See, what would happen was they would end up saying, you need to nail from the top of the finger down through the wrist. So most likely it was through the wrist, and you would end up, that would end up sufficing to carry your body weight. Then they would put one through your feet that were hemmed together, and then they would end up suspending you. And on average, learn this one, most people would last between uh, a day and six days. And so you're up there in agonizing pain as a condemned person, enduring the mocking and in pain the whole time. And interestingly enough, your diaphragm, every time that you would push up to get a breath, you're in pain. But you would have to because you had an easy time breathing in with your diaphragm, but a a difficult time breathing out. He's being humiliated and the gospel writers, they're silent on exactly what it looked like When Jesus was nailed, there's no mention of what it sounded like, but you could imagine. Being truly God and truly man. With his pursuit of you and joy being for him after the crucifixion, being at the right hand of the Father again. He's going through with this. You could imagine what could have been in the screams that were real. That filled the valley there. That made his mother end up shrieking. His friends end up crying. We don't know exactly what, but you could imagine. And Jesus endured every bit of that physical and emotional agony in pursuit of us. So that in 2022, some of us would already have put our trust in Christ. And some of our future kids or kids or grandkids would have an opportunity to put their salvation and confidence in Christ as well. And if you've ever wondered... Why it was so, well, first thing, if you ever wondered why Jesus' blood had to be spilt, it's all in the old covenant scriptures and through the, the law. You see, the life was in the blood, and so blood had to be spilled in order for the perfect lamb of God to give his life. That would have been his blood, had to be spilled so that it would be a substitutionary death and atonement so that our imperfections would be covered over by the perfect lamb of God, that we would put our trust in the perfect substitute from God. And why did it have to be so gruesome? One can speculate, and mine would end up being this. It is a perfect illustration of how gruesome and ugly sin is to God. The perfect holy lamb, morally perfect, how gruesome it was. Him enduring for generations prior to this. The stiff-neckedness of humanity not surrendering to him. That's how ugly of a picture that our sin is to a perfect God. But it isn't over yet. In all of this, he's going to press forward and he's going to end up showing his character. Check out his character here. Verse 25, he's on the cross. Standing near the cross where Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple who he loved, he said to her, dear woman, here's your son. And he said to his disciple, which was most likely the apostle John who wrote this, here is your mother. And from then, from then on, his disciple took her into his home. If there was any time 
that we could have given permission to Jesus to to concentrate and be self-focused, we see him actually others focused yet still. As he's on the cross for hours, his character is so sacrificial and his love is so sacrificial that he's looking out knowing that he doesn't have that many breaths. But that's the way, that's the reason why each sentence is so short when he's on the cross. And he's making each one of them count, pointing us to be sacrificial and others focused just as he was. As he was hurting, as he was being crucified, he's looking out to his friend and saying, take care of my mother. You have a, a new mother and, and her, and to his mother says, you have a new son in him. Look with me in verse 28, because he ends up having his final words. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished, and to fulfill scripture, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put it in a hyssop branch, and held it to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. The 33 years of limitation that Jesus had in an earthly vessel was finished. The scrutiny of man for the three years and his mocking of earthly ministry is finished. When he ended up coming here and had to end up being baptized by the Spirit, being truly man and truly God, to empower him to do what he already was capable of doing from eternity past, it's all finished. He goes to the cross, and in his last words, he says, it is finished. In church, that's the posture that we should take. To the power of sin, if you've been born again, you can say, it is finished. You can end up saying to generational curses in your life, to addiction, to alcoholism, to self-centered attitudes, it is finished. You can say to the power of sin that used to entangle us, those small things that used to captivate our attention, that drew us away from God, you can say, it is finished. You can have a posture of self-denial and self-sacrifice because Jesus said, it is finished. You've been purchased a new creation, new robes to put on because he said, it is finished. You do not have to operate as you once were as a father or as a mother or as a spouse or as a grandfather or a co-worker out of self-centeredness because he said, it is finished. Christ purchased every spiritual blessing and inheritance that we own, whether we neglect it or live in it or not, because he said it's finished. Every good thing and spiritual blessing has come because he said it is finished. We can build people up in their holy faith and use words of affirmation because he said it is finished. We can end up reading and praying and being close with the Father Because Jesus said it is finished. And not only that, in Hebrews 12, 2, we can actually be joyful and endure self-denial to promote others because he ended up saying it is finished. He says in Hebrews 12, the writer says, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. Regarding its shame, the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. Now he's seated at the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility. Here's wisdom. Born again person, think of all the hostility Christ endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. My friends who haven't consciously given your life to Jesus and say, God, you take it, you run it. Have Christ's sacrifice applied to you. Because unless you bow the knee to him, it won't. And every spiritual blessing that I just discussed and preached about won't be available to you. But it's already finished. If you truly haven't given your life to Christ, it's already finished. It is a free, paid-for gift. Amen? Amen? Receive it. Nothing, nothing is guaranteed in this life. Whether it be this afternoon or after today, Or the Huskers having a winning season. Nothing. (laughs) Nothing is guaranteed. But what is guaranteed is there will be a time, there will be a date, where you're going to have to answer to God after your last dying breath. And he will say, have you received my son? And at that moment, you will have wish you did. You will have wish you did. Let's go ahead and and, uh, pray.
pray, everyone with their, their um, heads down, eyes closed, it, if you desire for that moment to be now, I'm asking you to just raise, lift up your head, to even inquire about what it looks like to genuinely give your life to Jesus. So that, just to clarify, to genuinely first put, surrender your will and give your life to what's already paid for on the cross. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand specifically if you're desiring, if you've never done that before and you desire that much more to make that decision. Shepherd teachers, you see the room. You can put your hand down. Shepherd teachers, if you wouldn't mind getting to the back of the gym, please. And as we stand up, everyone can open your eyes. Everyone stand up. Whoever rose your hand, we want to be there to end up fielding questions and for you to genuinely make that decision today decisively to put your trust in Jesus. And so during this time, you're going to hear music for you who made that decision. Instead of going to communion or during the songs when everyone comes back, I'm asking you to make the brave decision at any time between now and the time that we leave today. There'll be two songs. We already know, we've identified you, head to the back so that we can encourage you in putting your life in Christ. So as we head into communion, you see there are four stations here. If you've been born again and you've put your, your will and received Christ as your savior, you put your will down, and you've trusted him for the forgiveness of your sins, this meal's for you. This is that moment. And so you're gonna end up seeing as you come up here There'll be wafers, there'll be juice representing Christ's body and his blood that he sacrificed on your behalf. Go to any one of those four stations. In my exhortation, anyone who's going there, would you take your time, take your time in thinking through the precious cost that we covered this morning. So I'm going to pray. After I pray, feel free to make your way to any station as Lexi leads us in songs of worship. Christ, thank you for your sacrifice, your good, your kind. In Jesus' name, amen.